Psi Access, May 11, 2024. Universal Design Principles for Interviews in Science and Engineering. Dr. Samuel M. Green. So hi everyone, um, my name is Sam Green. I'm from the University of Texas at Austin. I'm a white male with short hair and glasses. I use he, him pronouns. Um, and we're here today to, to discuss a project that we've been involved in, looking at ways to make interviews in science more accessible for disabled scientists. This project is done in collaboration with a number of co-authors we are all part of a group called Schmidt Science Fellows. We are an inter international inter interdisciplinary group of, of early career scientists, some of whom have visible or, or obvious disabilities, some, some have non-obvious disabilities, and others do not have disabilities. We are in very much embedded in the world of, of academic science. We all finished our PhDs in the past two or three years, and some of us have continued on to become professors in the sciences. So that kind of informs our perspective on this, the topic I'll be just discussing today. We are the research in, in science labs at various universities around the world. And we have discussions amongst ourselves about, about kind of the future of science and its impact on society. And so the work I'll be discussing today kind of grew out of uh, some of those conversations we had. So I don't think I need to, to mention to this group that um, people with disabilities are underrepresented in the sciences. We see that about 21% of, of Americans aged 18 to 44 have disabilities. And um, among recipients of bachelor's degrees in STEM, only 12% report having a disability. That number goes down to 10% for master's degree recipients and 8% for PhD recipients. And there are similar trends um, in other countries around the world as well. So um, we are all scientists, we like seeing data. And in the process of researching this project, we really could not find much data relative to that for other um, demographic groups. So um, there really is a need for more data in this space, in our opinion. So um, in the absence of data, we, we do see uh, the this underrepresentation and the challenges reflected in anecdotes from scientists with disabilities. This anecdote here is from one of the um, one of my co-authors. This person writes: I often question my decision not to disclose my disability when joining a new lab. I think that once others know me and my work, it will be safe to share this information and request the accommodations I need because I have proved I am worth it. I feel guilty for hiding my disability and frustrated because I could perform better and train myself less if I had access to accommodations. If I was given the opportunity to openly discuss my disability during an interview, or when starting a new job, I would, as it would signal an environment where equity and inclusion are important. So we see several key themes come up in this anecdote. One is this issue of disclosure and feeling the, the need or the pressure to disclose in laboratory environments. Another is the issue that disability just is not discussed openly that much in current uh, academic science, at least at the kind of PhD research level right now. We also see a number of kind of broader reasons for this underrepresentation. So um, one of them is that sometimes people hold negative perceptions of people with disabilities. There's research that shows that people with speech impediments are viewed as less intelligent and less competent as those without. Another issue is that live environments are not very accessible. This photo is from a lab at my current university. It was built about two years ago. We see that the walkways are cluttered and therefore hard for people who use wheelchairs to navigate. We see that the bench tops and the shelves are high, making it hard for people with wheelchairs to reach um, those, uh, the, the objects on the, the bench tops. 
Many of these glass bottles contain hazardous chemicals, so they are hard for people like me to manipulate safely in this lab environment. Um, and another issue is kind of uh, the ina inadequacy of accommodation mechanisms. So, for example, if somebody with with a disability wanted to work in this lab, they would face um, challenges in doing so, and it would be difficult for the PI who manages this lab to to kind of make the accommodation necessary to accommodate certain uh, disabilities. Another issue is with conferences. The, um, conferences are really important for kind of disseminating our science and, and getting our name out there in this academic world. And many conferences are not very accessible. For example, I went to a conference about two weeks ago um, and the conference, um, in the conference there were kind of multiple rooms with sessions happening in parallel and each room had a stage and none of the stages had ramps, they all had stairs. And in some cases, the stairs did not have railings. Um, so it would have been hard for certain people to access those stages. So um, we see a need to change this culture in the sciences. And we're focusing on enacting that change through uh, the interview process. We're focusing on interviews in particular because uh, for a few reasons, one of which is that the interview is a person's first encounter with a new environment. So it's their chance to assess the lab culture and judge if it will work for them. In the high stakes setting of an interview, people may hesitate to raise concerns about accessibility and address them in real time. We also think that if interviewers make an effort to make interviews more accessible, then that might spill over into other aspects of the labs that they manage. They might be more open to making changes to the labs themselves to make them more accessible. So we are proposing a set of recommendations to address these issues, and the recommendations apply to a number of different interview settings, including um, internships, PhD programs, fellowships, postdocs, um, faculty positions and industry positions. So we kind of talked amongst ourselves about our, we decided what our recommendations would be, and then we um, put, we decided to write them down and publish them in a paper that will be coming out short, soon. Um, so we, we kind of did some research into current best practices for accommodating people with disabilities in, in interviews. And we concluded that the current practices are not really adequate. So in many cases, interviewees are not invited to request accommodations uh, at all. There's no explicit invitation. And if an invitation is made, then it may only be made out of a sense of legal obligation and not out of a genuine sense to support the interviewee. In many cases, interviews are arranged kind of at the last minute, so there's not adequate time to arrange the necessary accommodations. And in many cases, there are many people involved in one interview, and not all people might be aware of what accommodations were agreed upon, so they might not be able to implement those during their portion of the interview. In some cases, interviewers may make presumptions about what is needed for certain people. So for example, one resource we found um, had this recommendation, and I quote, phrase interview questions such that they can be answered succinctly by people with speech impediments, end quote. So the issue with, with this is that it presumes a solution to what is needed for people with speech impediments. These people might not want to give succinct answers. They might want to instead discuss their accomplishments in rich detail and provide lots of background. And they might want the patients to do so in the context of a high stakes interview. So we are proposing a set of guidelines to, to improve upon the current interview practices. And our guidelines are based upon principles of universal design which were introduced very nicely in the previous talk. There are seven universal design principles, and we are focusing on 
the four that we think are most most applicable to interview settings. Equitable use, flexibility in use, perceptible information, and tolerance for error. So we we developed some, some suggestions based on these principles. Here are our suggestions. I'll just show them now, but I will talk through them in more detail in the next few minutes. So the first suggestion is to provide information about the interviewer in advance to all interviewees. So it's important to provide enough information that interviewees can decide what questions to ask, what, what they need to think about when um, deciding what accommodations to request in the, in the interview. This information could be, for example, the format of the interview, any um, time restrictions or time limits, whether the interviewee will be seated or standing, whether there's a podium, a microphone, what the structure of the breaks are, how many breaks there are and how long they are, um, things like this. We also think it's very important for interviewers to provide information about accommodations that previous successful applicants have received. This is to ensure interviewees that requesting accommodations will not adversely affect their chances of success in the interview. In some cases, it might be helpful to provide interview questions in advance as well. And we think that these recommendations reflect the principles of equ equitable use and perceptible information. Our second suggestion is to invite all interviewees to request accommodations regardless of disability status. So the goal here is to reduce the pressure on interviewees to explain or disclose information about their, their disability. We're saying there's no justification needed, just um, request the accommodations that, that you need. It's important to, to phrase these invitations in a way that does not pathologize disability. So an example of this language could be, and I quote, we want to help you present the best version of yourself in this interview so that we can accurately assess your fit for this position, end quote. This is a more positive framing rather than, oh, you have this problem, we will help you fix this problem. So uh, the invitation can include a list of, of accommodations that are available, such as additional time for breaks, sign language interpretation, or improved ventilation in the interview spaces. It's also very important that the interviewers honor whatever accommodations were agreed upon beforehand to ensure that interviewees do not encounter any surprises during their interview. We think that these um, suggestions reflect the principles of equitable use and flexibility in use. Our third recommendation is that um, interviewers evaluate interviewees' skills and experiences as they apply to the role in an unbiased manner. So this suggestion really came from a need to address kind of ableist attitudes um, towards uh, scientists with disabilities. We know that in some cases, interviewers make subconscious judgments about capability based on attributes that, that do not really matter for, for capability. We also know that in some cases, um, interviewers who rely too heavily on kind of rigid standardized metrics might inadvertently disadvantage disabled applicants. So to address these challenges, we're recommending that people practice a set of principles called holistic review. So this is basically allowing interviewees to demonstrate that they can fulfill the responsibilities of the role through multiple means. Um, it's not assuming that an interviewee has to, to, to perform in a certain way to, um, to be successful in the position for which they're interviewing. Related, related to this, it's important that um, interviewers use clear, clear criteria to assess the candidates and to um, evaluate their suitability for, for the position for which they're interviewing. So as you can see, as you might imagine, this might involve a little, little bit more subjectivity 
So it's important that interviewers undergo bias training to to remove any subconscious biases that may creep in here. So lastly, we acknowledge that um, changing the way interviews are conducted in a way that works for everybody is inherently a, a hard thing to do. So we encourage interviewers to be open to seeking feedback and making changes to the interview process. So um, one challenge here is an anonymity. We want to ensure that interviewees feel free to provide honest feedback and, and trust that providing that feedback will not adversely affect their chances of success in terms of receiving the position for which they're interviewing. So we're, we're recommending that, that um, interviewers use a third party to kind of manage the feedback process. This, this third party should collect feedback as soon after the interview as possible while the experience is still fresh in the interviewer's mind. And then the third party should withhold that feedback from the interviewer until the interviewer makes a decision to ensure that the feedback does not affect the decision-making process. If the third party decides that a change needs to be made, they should communicate that change to all interviewers, not just the interviewer who um, who, 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 interview, who interviewed the interviewee that requested that change. It should be communicated to, to all interview, interviewers. We also think that some, um, some level of oversight is important to this process. So um, overseeing agencies like funding agencies, for example, could request evidence of implement, implementation of these interview practices. So um, because you know, we acknowledge that this process is difficult, we provide some questions for institutions to consider when making these changes. And these are the questions we list in our, in our fourth Wayne publication. So one is how should interviewers compile a list of recommendations that previous successful applicants have received in a way that's anonymous, um, but also reflective of the full range of, of accommodations that others have received. Related to this, we want to assure that requesting accommodations will not adversely affect the, the chances, of, chances of success. So it's important to consider how to do this um, in a way that's genuine and uh, fair to everyone. They might also consider what questions to provide before the interview, again, to all um, applicants. And then related to the idea of holistic review, there's a question of what rubrics are needed to ensure fair selection throughout this process. And then lastly, um, how will feedback be collected anonymously and does, which third party should be involved in this process and how will they set that up? So um, here again are our, our, our suggestions. I'll just reiterate them now. The first is, is to provide information about the interview in advance to all interviewees. The second is to invite all interviewees to request accommodations regardless of disability status. The third is to evaluate interviewees' skills and experiences as they apply to the role in an unbiased manner using the principles of holistic review. And the fourth is to seek feedback and implement changes as needed. So to conclude, we think that these policies alone will not be enough to address the challenges that we identified um, in terms of, of um, people with disabilities participating in science. So we think that they need to be complemented with, with broader policies that support this goal. We think that national funding agencies like the NSF or NIH or DOE could support this effort. As I mentioned, uh, we'll be publishing these recommendations soon, maybe in the next week or two in the journal Our Science. So feel free to look for our article there. And if anyone has any ideas or comments or questions, 
feel free to send me an email at samuel.green at austin.utexas.edu. Thank you all for your attention today, and I look forward to the discussion over the next few minutes. One from Academic Crusader that says, a frequent and huge gap in efforts to improve accessibility is the ableism and inaccessibility and ableist attitudes of graduate programs and PhD committees. Um, what is your perspective on convincing professional organizations or employers to allow and further appreciate the need, necessity, and essential role of anonymity in facilitating accessibility efforts or accessibility concerns uh, in needs communicating with employers or professional organizations? Well, thank you for that question. I think there are several issues that were raised there. Um, one is communicating the need and the importance of this issue to graduate um, uh, departments and graduate programs. I think um, there's a growing body of evidence that supports the idea that when people with, with disabilities are involved in research, the research outcomes are, are, are there's a benefit in terms, of, in terms of the research outcomes. Um, there, so for example, I think there were, um, some studies about certain health conditions, and uh, in some cases, uh, there were some ethical issues related to data fabrication. And and I, I think that people with the people with those health conditions were more involved in the research, then it's less likely that people would fabricate data or engage in these um, these uh, kind of um, uh, unethical practices. The other issue you mentioned was anonymity, and we, we think that is critically important. Um, one challenge that we, and we acknowledge here is that there just aren't that many people in current science departments who have disabilities. And so if if um, you know, if a department releases information that says that these accommodations were granted, then it might be kind of obvious who, who those accommodations were, were for. So one idea we, we suggest is that um, in advance of, of, of the annual interview process, departments kind of pull all the faculty and get everyone's input into how the department as a whole could be made more accessible and then share the results of that poll with, with interviewees. Um, so so I, I agree it's a very tricky question and we, we don't have all the answers necessarily, but our, this article is intended to spark those kinds of discussions. So uh, thank you very, very much for your, your question. Thank you for your answer. <laughs> we have another question from Jill. I love the concept of holistic review. Do you have any recommendations of resources for this? Uh, yes, in our paper, um, we cite several um, articles that discuss holistic review and provide more specific um, recommendations. Um, feel free to send me an email as well if, if you'd like me to, to forward those resources to, to, to you. Thank you. And if you could also share your email in the chat uh, sure. so that attendees can reach out to you. Thank you so much. Of course. I have one more question from Gala. How do people you interview talk about quote unquote reasonable in accommodation and who defines what is reasonable? I agree, that's a tricky question. Um, I think this comes back to, it comes back to what is needed to perform the role. Um, if, if, the, if the accommodations are made that are kind of make it apparent that um, the, that the person does not have the ability to, to perform the role, um, that they're interviewing for, then, then um, it may be that, that there's a decision that, well, I want, I want to be, I want to choose my words carefully here. I mean, I think it's a very, very important question, and I think it needs to be decided in the context of, of um, you know, what's needed for the role. I think that um, we need a broader discussion in the sciences about what it means to be a disabled scientist and what 
and how departments will, will support disabled scientists. So, um, so I think it may take some time to kind of get up to speed in terms of implementing the support me mechanisms we need. So in terms of what is reasonable, I think that's a hard question and I don't think I, I have the best answer to that. Um, but I'm hoping that our piece will spark those very important conversations. Thank you. And one more question of where do you see the largest area of improvement needed? Well, I mean, I, I, I think interviews are just the first step. I think the 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 broader issue here is kind of the attitude in the sciences um, and perception from people with, with disabilities addressing these misconceptions that people with disabilities are people with disabilities are, are less capable, um, less able to perform these laboratory tasks. I think there's a need to to address those those ableist attitudes. And then once that happens, I think many of the other other changes that are needed will, will kind of follow that naturally from that. SciAccess. Learn more at www.sciaccess.org.